Episode 20, 1869, the National Peace Jubilee, Part 3. The stage was set. The Colosseum was built and indeed Boston had prepared and all was overseen by P.S. Gilmore and his many committees. Emotions filled with doubts, sarcasm, amazement and cynicism were now replaced with hope, excitement and delight that such an event could actually take place. Welcome back to episode 20 and part 3 of the National Peace Jubilee story and the enormity of this event. You'll wonder why, as I have done before, why this is not taught as part of any history curriculum or musicology course anywhere in America that I can find. If, by the way, you can uh, find a professor or teacher that does indeed include a module on the Peace Jubilee, please forward his or her name to me so I can give them the credit that they duly deserve. So please click like and subscribe below to this episode and it will help the channel uh, a lot. Let me uh, and it'll let you know when the next video is indeed live. Thank you for that. In the last episode, I mentioned about the doubters and those that didn't want this to continue or succeed. And there were those even in the school board who at the last moment brought accusations that the building was dreadfully dangerous. And so, uh, to them, the building was not suitable for their choirs of children that were been trained in the school system uh, to sing on Children's Day. Panic. Ener engineers report City Hall. More timber needed to be brought into the Colosseum to support the beams. And after all of that was done, finally peace in the land and reluctant acceptance from those who no longer could protest. Finally, there seemed to be, as we would say today, all systems go. Decorations of flags from all states and from countries were hung to decorate the interior. The Scientific American newspaper suggested that the big uh, bass drum was the biggest ever made. Uh, with It took two oxen hides um, just to uh, manufacture it. President Grant's announcement that he was bringing his cabinet to the Coliseum meant that Boston had to muster four regiments to accompany him to the visit. And when he did arrive on the evening of the first day, reports existed that um, both he and Gilmore mounted horses as they viewed the Coliseum, smoked a cigar and talked about the war. A special area, as a safety area, I suppose we'd call it today, was constructed apart from the Colosseum, but especially for the storage of axes, rakes, shovels and all implements necessary in the case of fire. And two fire engines were stationed within the Colosseum itself. In addition to 36 fire extinguishers in the building, this was unknown in the 19th century. The smoking of pipes and cigars was even banned, and these imp improvements combined all helped to allay the fears of the school boards uh, who had been fearful for the safety of their children. The telegraph office and press room inside the front door of the building was an innovation for America, and in industry first in communication, especially for the usage of newspapers attending this extravaganza. Seven telegraph machines were provided by Western Union to transmit messages to and from the newspapers across the nation and even distant continents. P.S. Gilmore was acutely aware of the power and the importance of newspapers in society and had invited over 180 
broadsheets from across the nation and Canada and Europe to attend and obviously report on the extravaganza. Already, all na national and foreign uh, papers mentioned the development of the Coliseum building at Back Bay in Boston with ornate lithographs across the world. Uh, wait, uh, people waited for news of the event in the hub, as it was known then. The hub was Boston and the Hubbites were the in inhabitants of Boston because the hub is the center of not only the wheel, but the universe. And that's how they wanted to be thought of at that stage. Finally, from the newspapers, everything was now ready. The city was rapidly filling up with visitors and others who were intent on attending the festival. They were coming from the north, south, east and west, from all the states, Democrats and Republicans, Union and Confederates, all differences were forgotten. And in old Massachusetts, the early home of the Pilgrims, and in Boston, the cradle of American independence, the sweet notes of peace drew all together in one accord and with one desire. We wish them to a hearty welcome, the papers announced. The Accommodation Committee had worked hard to facilitate the thousands of musicians and hundreds of core societies in need of shelter. But many more thousands that were arriving by train to the metropolis created a huge demand. Cartoons were even printed at boarding houses where you could rent a chair to sleep in the kitchen, whilst you could hang your children like clothes over the fireside to sleep soundly. This wasn't far from the truth. The stories even abounded of some unscrupulous establishments where you could rent um, the stairs to sleep step by step. The first day, Tuesday, June the 15th, 1869. The weather that morning was dull but with some rain, but even so people started gathering in late morning around the huge building. The shanties, which uh, housed various transient businesses, began doing a bit brisk trade, selling clothes, mementos, foods, and by 1 p.m. there was a substantial crowd gathered round all the, of the doors. Every avenue to the event was now thronged with people, a truly magnificent scene where arrangements had been so well made. There was an absence of any confusion. By 3 p.m. over two-thirds of the seats were filled. The chorus of 10,000 singers, 1,000 orchestra, soloists and all participants in this wonderful event were now in place to raise their voices and instruments to the heavens and respectfully command the Almighty himself to sprinkle peace over the land today. At 3 p.m., at 3.10 p.m., the proceedings began with prayers from a Reverend Hale. The three conductors for the festival were noted as P.S. Gilmore, Carl Zahran and Julius Eichberg. After all the formalities were completed, Gilmore made his appearance and to thunderous applause and shouts from this across the stadium floor, he climbed to his rostrum and acknowledged the praise. The first piece, God is a Castle and Defense by Luther with organ and orchestral accompaniment. Second piece was Tannhauser, attributed by mistake in the program uh, to Mozart, but obviously by Richard Wagner. And when Gilmore had decided to include this in the program, a letter had been forwarded immediately to Richard Wagner in Leipzig to arrange for the orchestral arrangements for this piece to be sent post haste from the composer himself. The richness of strings, it was suggested, weaved a network through the groundwork of bass instruments. This was conducted by Eichberg. 
Third piece was Gloria. Fourth piece was sung by Madame Paripa Rosa, or, um, and she performed Ave Maria. And the fifth piece was part one of the Star, Star Spangled Banner, with everything included. Grand orchestra, military band, drums, organ, uh, artillery and chiming of, of bells. The intermission of 15 minutes was then held when everyone was jubilant, delighted with the overwhelming success of the performance. Congratulations, tears of joy and laughter filled the air. After the intermission, the hymn of peace uh, was recited by Oliver Wendell Holmes. William Tell Overture, followed by the Inflammatus, uh, the Carnation March, and number 10 for the day, the Anvil Chorus from Verdi's Il Travatore with P.S. Gilmore conducting was then performed with 100 Boston firemen an accompaniment of 15 artillery guns, the full band and orchestra. Each of the firemen were dressed in red shirts, white caps and blue pants. Prior to the piece being performed, Gilmore ordered that the gas lights were turned down to dim and the resultant effect when the firemen struck the full-size anvils was that in the moment when the hammers came in contact with the anvils, the colours of the American flag was reproduced 100 times each time the hammers struck. It should also be emphasised that the hammers and the steel had been making headlines recently as the Union Pacific Railroad had, on the previous month, completed the rail link at Promontory Point in Nebraska, and so the use of anvils and national colours was very symbolic as it emphasised the national, national feeling about this project. Newspapers across the country and the world carried reports and reviews of the event as it happened. New, New York papers displayed a certain hesitance uh, to the project from the start, with doubts being raised about its viability and location, its possibility of success or indeed failure. Of course, the competition between the hub in Boston and Gotham City, New York, was an ongoing issue with both claiming status over the other in cultural uh, terms chiefly. On the second day, President Grant and his cabinet had arrived the previous evening and, according to some sources, went to the Coliseum, where, after greetings and pleasantries, both he and Gilmore mounted horses and rode around the perimeter, smoking cigars. While Grant had no musical ear or even an inclination towards the divine art, he knew the importance of music in the, both the theatre of war and to the people back home. Now he also realised the importance of this event as part of the reconstruction of the nation and a return to positivity amongst his people. The second day in advance had been declared a complete success in respects because the famous general national hero and now the president was here with governors members of Congress, secretaries of state, mayors and all people of importance. Of course, the newspapers amazed that 50,000 people could fit under the same roof reported on these proceedings. It had never been heard of before in the world, imagine. The weather that day was fine and the interior was impressive beyond description. Flags and bunting were suspended from the rafters and the uprights. The stars and stripes adorned every window. And so, when the president entered the building, the reception was rapturous. The vast crowd rose 
and cheered with waving ha and handkerchiefs, hats and other demonstrations greeted him. He was welcomed by the mayor of Boston. P.S. Gilmore then went up in the conductor's stand and was greeted with shouts and cheers from the assembled throng. In response to his signal, the choir, the choir rose and, supported by the complete orchestra of nearly 1,000 musicians, they um, collectively burst into song. The Boston Journal acclaimed that all in the land had become used to reading reports of vast armies led by Grant and Sherman in the tens of thousands, but to see so many people gathered together inside the, the building with an equal, if not greater, crowd seated outside Listed, listening to the music for the event was truly incredible and a sight to behold. Filled uh, with crowds far exceeding the first day, it was estimated by the New York Times on June the 17th that there were at least 40,000 spectators and listeners plus the crowd inside. More next week from the story of the National Peace Jubilee. And please, before you go, click like and subscribe and make any comments that you wish or send me an email to gilmersband at gmail.com. And I thank you for um, what was an exciting report from 1869. Bye now.